I've been on something of a metrology kick lately, and it started a couple years ago when I was watching Dan Gelbart's video on high accuracy. I'll put a link below. In that, he talks about the reversal method, which is a way for having a crooked reference, and by flipping it around to average out the errors, you can use a crooked reference to measure the straightness of something else with extreme accuracy. And that pretty much blew my mind, so I wanted to, to know more about that, and it eventually led me to a book called Fundamentals of Dimensional Metrology, which is pretty high on the nerd scale, but I only paid 47 cents for it when I bought it. I read pretty much the entire book, not to say that I remembered all of it, but this just opened my eyes to a lot of things, and I ended up buying this linear gauge but it has a one micron resolution and it outputs a digital signal which is really handy because it's just a square wave and that means that i can read it with hobby electronics like an arduino or something very easily and have confidence that i'm i'm reading it correctly there's another book that i came across called precision spindle metrology you can read excerpts of this book elsewhere and they talk about being able to plot the run out of spindles and different things on the the nanometer scale and how you can actually see the, 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 the droop that it's gonna have between balls and the bearing as it rolls over. I mean, really wild stuff. Robin Renzetti, his channel is Rob Renz on YouTube, has some videos also where he, he just exhales onto a, a flat and he has a millionth indicator on it. And you can see the thing droop as the top expands more than the bottom. Stuff like that for me just helps unpack what's, what's really going on. Not that I have any practical use for one micron resolution, but you know, it's a number that you hear thrown around and being able to get a real intuitive feel for what it is, is pretty neat. So I thought it'd be fun to, to buy this thing and try and plot some run out on my lathe spindle and just see what I could see. I mean, it's only a three jaw, so obviously I expect there to be a thousandth or two of run out and some other things. Um, I don't expect to be able to see the, the actual bearings. I think you need to go more accurate than that. This one does have some force that it's imparting on the piece. That could be an issue. So I have a, a shaft here and we can measure the roundness of it, or not the roundness, but the diameter because you can have a constant diameter without being round. So what we have here is a homemade constant diameter shape. If we put that there and another stick on top, it stays at the same height. So you can measure something all the way around and it'll probably be pretty round but that constant diameter does not guarantee it. This gauge came from eBay, but it was new, still in the packaging, and looks pretty good, but I don't trust it yet. So let's go ahead and slip some gauge blocks under it to verify the measurements. These gauge blocks are just economy grade, but they are new and they have very little use on them. I measured them with the micrometer and they come in pretty much bang on as far as the size. Obviously I'm getting fingerprints all over them, but we have a half inch one there to serve as our reference. This one's 0.101, so we should be getting about 25.65 micron. Just lift that up, slip it under, and we've got 25.68. So I think that's well within our noise margin here. And when I remove it, it should go back to zero, and we get minus seven, which is showing some of our, our noise. Flexibility in the system, all of that sort of thing. 25.72. Minus six. So that one's pretty good. We're within maybe plus minus five-ish. Uh, this is 0.2 inches, so we should be getting about 5,080. So that is bang on, except that we were minus six before. So it's still within our, our margin and minus eight, so it's repeating reasonably well on there. This setup here with the dial indicator arm is good enough for dial indicators, but I definitely get the feeling that I should be much stiffer. I should build something more solid to really get the stiffness that we need to repeat on this type of scale. And we've got 19025, so that's our nominal number. Do a little rotation, 025. 024, 025. So I'm feeling pretty good about the diameter consistency of this shaft. I need a way to trigger measurements on whatever is in the spindle here regularly around the intervals. So I have a rotary encoder 
here. It's just jammed into a piece of plastic. It has a little bit of run out, so I fixed it with this piece of wood, which is just going and sitting very easily on here. This thing should repeat within a couple of divisions, one or two, and I've seen that pretty well when I rotate it around to the same position on the shaft and keep it in a very similar situation versus lifting up and down on the plunger like I was before. So I thought it'd be interesting here to show that right now I'm reading zero, how little force it takes to actually move something like this. And this is fairly rigid as far as this lathe is concerned. Nice big shaft. I apply just a little bit of force. And we go up a micron, back down to zero. A little bit more force, three microns. Three down, back to zero. Four, whoa. I accidentally touched the thing there, so we got 10. It just gives you a sense of how small a micron is that, I mean, just touching this thing with your finger does that. Imagine the forces that you get when you, you have a cutting tool on there. Let's fire this thing up and see what we get. We're going to be triggering off the rotary encoder here this time, and I'm going to be plotting it on a graph which is running, and we'll use the motor to drive it. You can see that we get a pretty consistent signal. It's a nice sine wave. There's a little spike at the beginning, but otherwise it's, it's pretty consistent. The problem with this, of course, is that it's fairly difficult to make sense of this sine wave in terms of the, the dimensions or anything else, even if it's static. So what I'm gonna be doing now is taking this and taking the offset in micron here, the displacement that it gets, making a 100 unit circle and then increasing or decreasing the diameter by that offset. So anything above or below 100 on this graph is going to represent the number that I got out of there. And that gives us a more comfortable way to look at this and make sense of the numbers. Since watching this thing spin around is not very visually engaging, I'm going to skip around a little bit, have a montage of sorts. On the 50 RPM one, the very first test, this is about the slowest that I could get the lathe to go. We had quite a bit of a jitter here. I was almost excited at the beginning and thought, wow, look at all the, the detail that we can see. Here's a little bump where it repeats. But then I thought about that motor, and the reason why it was the slowest that I could go is that motor was barely struggling to keep going. And I haven't plotted this against time for how fast it was going. That 50 is what the display was showing also, and not necessarily the actual uh, speed of rotation. But I'll bet you that that was actually due to motor vibration and the eccentricity, so the amount that I had to shift this thing to get it back in the center was about 9.7 microns, so call it 10. This is the same data plotted just over one rotation, and you can kind of see some of that jitter in there, and you can see that there's some, some noise and uh, different things. So same stuff, different view. This is from 0 to 2 pi on the x-axis. Here we are at 110 RPM. We have almost the same eccentricity, and it looks quite a bit better. You can still see that defect where it was bouncing, but it's also interesting to see that it's kind of a little bit too big here. And over here, the red is just the average, the center. So that's about double the RPM of before. And then we go almost double the RPM again. We have a very similar eccentricity number here, basically the same if you round it. 210 RPM, 4X what we were before, but it matches 110 quite well. We have our bounce, a little bit too big there, a little bit too big there. This rotation is not maintained. It just resets every time. So, you know, this could be pointing here or over here another time. It's all the same thing. And you can see here, so this is 210 with the second type of plot, that there's much less jitter in this one. It's much smoother information. If we go to 320 RPM, you can see this thing jumping all over the place and you could hear the squeaking when it was recording, so I wasn't really surprised to see this. I forgot to mention that these lobes here on the 210 and the very similar ones here and here on the 110 RPM, my speculation for the cause of this is that that off-axis encoder that I just jammed in the end, you can see it going back and forth. I'll put in a clip here. And I was almost wondering if this contributed to that. It doesn't seem like it should exert a lot of force on it, but if you go with Occam's razor, which is an interesting thing, you can look it up and try and find the explanation with the fewest number of assumptions. Having a periodic thing like this seems like it might be a reasonable explanation. 
I had to monkey with the settings a little bit, but I saw something very interesting when I went to take this shaft out. You can see right here the line where that carbide ball was sliding. And if I rotate this around, it's very consistent. And then if you remember that defect that we saw where it bounced, where is it at? Right there. See that? There's our defect. I'm going to take this piece out now and get another one because this is too hard and trim just a little bit off and try to get a piece that's really concentric with the axis of rotation. I want a piece that's relatively large on the diameter so that the indicator doesn't have a tendency to fall off here or do kind of a stick slip thing. It's going to do it anyway, but at least it'll minimize it a bit. And I also want a tapped hole in the end so that I can put a screw in there and just use a wrench to try and apply some pure torque, relatively pure torque, uh, to help spin this thing without wobbling it around. So this one happens to fit the bill. It's a little over an inch in diameter. It's got a 1032 thread in the end for some reason. And I'm gonna check it out. To take off some of the burrs and the sharp edges and just help the surface finish, I got a little bit of 600 grit here. We're all set up on our new piece here. I'm letting it run in a little bit so it can get that groove and maybe correct for some of the surface finish imperfections. And then we'll gather some data. For my hand crank rotations, I ended up just doing it by hand like this on two sides to avoid trying to put a, any sort of downward or up or any direction force on it. Because I realized that if I put the screw in this way, I'll be unscrewing it from here, and I didn't have a wrench that would really work that well anyway, even if I jammed it, so gave up, did it by hand. It seemed pretty consistent, so I'm going to go with it. I'm definitely applying less force than I did when I got it to deflect up and down out here. So here we have the data for the trimmed pieces, the pieces where I chucked it up and then trimmed it to get it as concentric as I could. We're at 60 RPM here, a little bit faster than the other one. First thing to notice is that our eccentricity is basically zero. I mean, it is zero if you round it down to the nearest unit. And those vibrations, which I'm speculating from the motor, are beautiful, very consistent all the way around. Just, just look at that. <laughs> Crank it up to 110 RPM. As expected, it goes down. Uh, the eccentricity is exactly the same. And it looks great. It's definitely better than the other one. 210 RPM, not a lot of difference. A little bit more jumping around in some areas. I guess it's a bit, eh, no, I'm sticking to it. Not much difference. 290 RPM, eccentricity still rounds to zero. I guess it looks a little bit better than before. Starting to bounce some on maybe some of those errors. And here I am rotating it by hand, so it's going very slow. And I was doing my best not to, to offset it in any direction. So 0.3 rounds to zero again. And do it a, doing it a second time by hand, getting the same thing. And even in these cases, I'm getting those lobes on the side, which I'm speculating are from the encoder. So... That was pretty interesting. Next up though is I want to make a cut on this while this thing is pointed this way and see how much it deflects from the, the cutting force. I've mounted the gauge in this direction to try and capture the, the biggest movement because this piece wants to climb up that cutter as it rotates this way. So hopefully this will be a good measure of that. Trying to measure while cutting turned out to be a total flop. I had to crank up the surface speed so that I could actually make a cut. And I think that this thing was just jittering back and forth enough at that higher speed that the signal coming out of it was a higher frequency than the Arduino can manually decode. I don't have a, a chip on there looking at the quadrature signal, so the actual readout was basically just counting upwards continuously instead of behaving normally like it, it usually does. And when I slowed it down, it worked fine. So anyway, what I'm going to do is just apply sort of what feels like a roughly correct amount of pressure like that I would apply to the tool on here and just get a, a number for the deflection. So we've got zero. I'm gonna come in with my cutter here. I'm gonna touch. And I would say that's pretty typical right there. 16. Back to one. What if I put some heavy sideways pressure 
that's going to do a whole lot of nothing because it's not trying to climb the piece right now. But if I put even a, a nice crank on there, like you would when parting, I mean it is not hard to go 30 or 40 microns. I've easily put that on things before. I think this has been pretty interesting, but one obvious problem with the measurements that I've been making here is that I have to touch the piece and that's been causing vibrations and some other issues. And when you read through some of these papers on the, the really serious people, the professionals, they all, for the most part, are using capacitive sensing. And I have a capacitive, pretty high resolution capacitive sensor for my string measurement project or that I bought for that project and I don't need any more. So I might pull that off there and try and, and set it up on there, um, which would be pretty cool to try and get some better measurements. The other thing that they talk about is that there's a whole bunch of different errors that can go on in your spindle, but the two main ones are the one that we think of, which is being off axis like this, but you can also be crooked, right? Where it's, it's doing something like this. You could be floating around in your bearing, which gives you random noise. And with capacitive sensors, you can have two, I guess you could have two with that also, but they'll have one here and one 90 degrees, and that helps them better differentiate between, for example, something that's wobbling around like this and something which is actually oval shaped. I don't know if that makes sense. Maybe it doesn't make sense. Like I said, it's my first time through. I'm doing this to, to learn it. But the point is you get more information out of that um, and not just and more than just having one in two positions at different times. So anyway, it seemed pretty cool and that thing has two channels on it. So hey, I think I know what I'm looking to in the future. But uh, anyway, thank you for watching and I'm going to get back to the table pretty soon. I just got a little bit distracted this week.